The Kremlin propaganda machine has worked hard to mislead the West, as well as its own people, with horrifying myths about what could happen if Russia was to collapse. The story goes that such an event would cause no less than a global catastrophe. And unfortunately, this fable has been accepted as the undeniable truth by many Western politicians and diplomats, who in turn are inclined to forgive the Kremlin's wrongdoings in a misguided attempt to prevent horrible global consequences. The tradition of such intimidation dates back to the times of the late USSR, when communist propaganda even managed to influence such politicians as Margaret Thatcher and George Bush Sr., who on the eve of the collapse of the Soviet Union called on the peoples enslaved by Moscow to remain within the renewed imperial concentration camp. Despite their appeals, the USSR faded into oblivion and the overall living conditions for the former Soviet citizens eventually significantly improved despite the cries of those still nostalgic for the good old days. The modern Russian Federation is a territory inhabited by different nations practicing different religions. And these nations have absolutely no motive except for force and coercion to live in a single state. Moreover, the compulsion to preserve the empire condemns the population of the Russian Federation to languish in the conditions of authoritarianism, colonial exploitation of the regions, and assimilation of practically enslaved peoples. Most will agree that a potential collapse of the Russian Empire could not be more catastrophic than the dissolution of the USSR, which therefore may be a fitting geopolitical reference point to use in disproving some of these myths. To further explore this matter, let's separate and carefully analyze each one in more detail. Myth number one. The collapse of the Russian Federation will lead to wars between regions. To support this myth, the Russian propaganda offers as an example the breakdown of Yugoslavia. However, in pushing this narrative, they deliberately withhold the fact that the president of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic, launched a frenzied propaganda of Serbian imperial chauvinism which made the Serbs feel bitter about the loss of their empowered position, while the other peoples of Yugoslavia despised the idea of living in a state where only the Serbs ruled. Putin's regime is also trying to play out this nationalist scenario under the guise of the Russian world. However, the situation in modern-day Russian Federation is significantly different from that in the former Yugoslavia. Russia's long-term imperial narrative prevented the very formation of Russians as a nation. It may not be a simple coincidence that while referring to other nations by nouns, Russians mostly use an adjective as self-reference. Could it be because Russian means imperial and nothing more? Even among the bearers of imperial consciousness, the majority receives no advantages from living in the modern-day Russian Empire. On the contrary, Moscow, as the imperial center, receives the greatest benefits from the resources of its subjugated territories, while they are left to languish in economic poverty and political oppression. The Kremlin also fails to substantiate this myth with any credible causes for military aggression between the regions. As the experience of the dissolution of the USSR shows, the newly freed states would be much more likely to direct their energy towards stabilizing the political situations within themselves and establishing a new order of life. Conflicts like the Karabakh or Transnistria were artificially created and fueled by the Kremlin. Without Moscow's intervention, the post-USSR hotspots, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Donbass and many others, simply would have never been ignited. In the event the imperial center ceases to exist, there will be no one left to provoke these conflicts. Additionally, the countries of Siberia and the Far East would finally have the opportunity to independently manage and benefit from their huge natural resources. And for the relatively small local populations, this would mean an opportunity to live in abundance, similar to the native populations of Saudi Arabia, provided that a fair system of distribution of the domestic product is created. The only substantiated potential geopolitical problem may occur in some regions of the Caucasus. Here, Moscow has created a confusing system of arbitrary administrative borders made only more complex by the consequences of many waves of communist deportations of the locals. But even in this case, the conflicts without imperial incitement would remain localized. Myth number two. The collapse of the Federation can cause a rise in extremism and provoke ethnic cleansing. The events of the early 90s disprove the claims that newly emerged states would tend to develop dictatorships that engage in ethnic cleansing. 
Following the collapse of the USSR, not a single newly formed country suffered ethnic persecutions, excluding the instances in which Moscow deliberately provoked such conflicts. The so-called Parade of Sovereignties took place peacefully up until the Kremlin started interfering in it. The newly emerged Ural and Siberian republics were headed by people who sought to control the economic resources of these territories. It so happens that the struggle of Siberians for the creation of their own states had a long tradition, originating from the movement of Siberian regionalism. This movement had advocated for the formation of an autonomous Siberian state since the mid-19th century. Tatarstan's post-USSR struggle for state sovereignty also occurred in a peaceful manner with no signs of ethnic oppression. A future liberation of Tatarstan and other countries of the Volga and Ural regions can take the form of a confederation of free Idel Ural states, consisting of Pashkortostan, Chuvashia, Mariel, Mordovia, Tatarstan, and Udmurtia. Ichkeria, also referred to as Chechnya, was the only state where armed confrontation took place. However, the military conflict was set in motion and wholly fueled by the Kremlin. The Chechen authorities did not carry out any ethnic cleansing, while Moscow was most surely known to put indigenous populations through its filtration camps. It is also important to note the independence movements in Ingria, Karelia, Kazakhia and other regions of modern-day Russia. The majority of populations in these regions refer to themselves as Russians, but carry Finno-Hungarian, Turkic or Kozak roots, which are likely to make themselves known in an event of another chance for independence. These historic events serve as proof that without artificial incitement of inter-ethnic hostilities by the imperial center, the process of dismantling the empire will occur peacefully and without significant manifestations of any ethnic extremism. Myth number three. Political power in the newly formed states will be seized by criminal elements. This claim is ridiculed by the very fact that the modern Russian Federation is ruled by the officers of the former Soviet state security organization known as CHK. The long list of known and proven crimes committed by this organization during the Soviet times includes mass terrors, deportations on ethnic grounds, artificial famines, unfounded imprisonments, torture, and countless other glaring human rights abuses. The descendants of this organization, now in power in the Russian Federation, still employ similar methods, not excluding insidious murders of those opposing the regime with Novichok nerve agent and polonium. The deep connection of Russia's ruling class with the organized crime is further proven by the fact that it was Chaka's efforts that aided in the formation of a system known as Thieves-in-Law in the early 20th century. It was basically mobster elites who controlled the Gulag prisoners and eventually governed the dark gaps in Soviet life beyond the reach of KGB. With the collapse of the USSR, the KGB continued using organized crime in its schemes to privatize state property. Putin's own collaborations with the Tambov organized crime gang is nothing short of common knowledge. The formation of new states on the ruins of the Russian Federation will lead to a change of elites, therefore creating an opportunity to finally put an end to the rule of the Czechist oligarchy built on corruption and crime. Myth number four, the great economic collapse. Allegedly, the collapse of Russia will lead to the impoverishment of its people, which in turn will cause mass migration to Ukraine and other neighboring states. To support this argument, the propaganda uses the example of the severe economic crisis of the early 90s, caused by the dissolution of established economic ties and the conversion of enterprises from government to private property. An important factor that is omitted by this argument is the significant industrial changes that have occurred in the modern-day Russia as compared to the economy of the USSR, the backbone of which was solely the military-industrial complex. Many modern Russian enterprises have no connection to the military and, importantly, have access to foreign markets, which was never the case with the Soviet Union. In fact, the annihilation of the imperial center will allow many regions to directly receive considerable benefit from their respective industries, all the profits from which is currently being appropriated by Moscow. For example, Bashkortostan, Tatarstan and Yakutia can enjoy considerable profits from the sale of oil, Buryatia from uranium and the Republic of Komi from timber trade. 
Other regions, such as Königsberg, Karelia, the Kuril Islands, and Sakhalin, may follow the path of joining the economically developed countries of which they were once a part. Even for the regions that can't boast vast reserves of natural resources, independence would not mean poverty. Consider the example of post-Soviet Georgia. At the time of the collapse of the USSR, it was considered a country with the weakest economic potential of all foreign republics. Additionally, the power in the country was quickly usurped by a group of USSR-era leaders headed by Eduard Shevardnadze. However, as soon as the country ended the dictatorship of this Kremlin comrade, many economic opportunities came about and the standard of living of Georgia's citizens improved quite significantly. This gives one reason to believe that if the currently depressed regions of Russia approach the elections of their governments with sensibility, their chances for an economic renewal can be equally as optimistic. All these examples are reassuring in the fact that the collapse of the Russian Federation should not provoke anarchy, wars, economic decline, or mass migration from these territories. Last but not least, myth number five, the spread of nuclear weapons among newly formed states. The example of the collapse of the Soviet Union testifies to the irrelevance of this argument. The collapse did not result in a much feared free trade of nuclear weapons. Moreover, the governments of the newly independent states approached the management of their respective nuclear arsenals in a responsible manner. One shouldn't even exclude the possibility of these countries voluntarily abandoning nuclear weapons, as Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus did in the 1990s. Only this time around, the new state entities will consider the bitter experience of Ukraine falling prey to nuclear Russia after denuclearizing themselves. So the new countries will be smart to demand solid guarantees of state security from the countries interested in their denuclearization. For those particularly anxious about the potential nuclear dangers of, of Russia's collapse, we should reiterate that at the present time it is Moscow that threatens the world with nuclear weapons. It is the Kremlin today, just as during the Cold War, that still uses nuclear blackmail to achieve its interests and openly threatens the existence of our entire planet. The collapse of the Russian Federation would not only not be a catastrophe, but instead present a bounty of possibilities for all the nationalities still enslaved by Moscow, as well as Russia's neighbors it regularly terrorizes. Newly emerging countries will have the opportunity for democratic reforms, which are currently being subverted in favor of preserving the authoritative regime of the wannabe empire. For the countries that are currently strongly under the sphere of influence of the Russian empire in all its guises, the domineering influence of the insatiable imperial center will disappear, as will the Kremlin-backed criminal oligarchic regimes, which will present endless new prospects for development and growth. The collapse of the regional rule of Russia will put an end to wars, ethnic conflicts, the absolute rule of crime and economic deterioration. This is because Moscow, which alone has always been the sole beneficiary of these unsettling processes, will now become the capital of a foreign, separate, small state with a new name and no power to wreak havoc in its vicinity. The collapse of the Russian Federation is undeniably a much more optimistic prospect for the entire world than the very existence of Russia in its current state. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe.